Please stand for the reading of the gospel. In the 15th year of the reign of Emperor Tiberius, when Pontius Pilate was governor of Judea, and Herod was ruler of Galilee, and his brother Philip ruler of the region of Iturea and Trachonitis, and Lysanias ruler of Abilene, during the high priesthood of Annas and Caiaphas, the word of God came to John, son of Zechariah, in the wilderness. He went into all the region around the Jordan, proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins, as it is written in the book of the words of the prophet Isaiah. The voice of one crying out in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make his path straight. Every valley shall be filled, and every mountain and hill shall be made low and the crooked shall be made straight, and the rough ways made smooth, and all flesh shall see the salvation of God. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Advent means coming. But what's coming? Well, Christmas, right? We are awaiting the coming of Christ or to celebrate that Christ has come. God has come in the flesh. But is that it? Is that all we're waiting for? It means at least that. Christians celebrate the coming of the invisible, immaterial God who took our place and joined the divine story and the human story in a new and powerful way. No more could we claim that God does not understand us, that God is somehow by nature of divinity immune from pain and suffering and the complexities of the human condition, including the threat of an experience of death even. God knows. God knows us. And God knows us from the inside out. Out. Now, to find God, we don't have to call down heaven because heaven came down. Now we can look within, and in truth, we always could. We just didn't know. But no, that's not all we are waiting for. Christianity, like Judaism, is a historical religion. All this takes place in the flesh, in our life, in our world. Our faith is embodied, and that embodiment challenges all our social arrangements. The coming peace we talk about at Advent isn't limited to the individual peace we feel because of the nearness of God to us in our hearts although it is that. It's also the peace of all things being rightly ordered. That is what Jews call shalom and Muslims call salam. It's a kind of completeness or wholeness, safety and security. It's a world where everyone has a place next to everyone not with some above and some below, some having privileges granted by authorities, but instead only by God. Our world continues to promote inequalities and violence more than peace. In Texas now, a woman who is pregnant from a violent rape may be forced to give birth against her will. And at the same time, the will to buy and brandish a gun that can take born life is seen as an expansive right. What's more, those least likely to be hurt by these policies are most likely to be in the positions to make them. This is mad and maddening. But it's not new. Roman society was ordered in ways like this too. From the top down, a patronage 
culture in which power flowed from the rulers down to the people at their whim or will, not by right. In fact, the whole idea that government should be at the consent of the governed is rooted in an alternative biblical vision. Like, look at the way Luke begins his gospel story. He names names and places. In the 15th year of the reign of Emperor Tiberius, when Pontius Pilate was governor of Judea and Herod was the ruler of Galilee and his brother Philip, ruler of the region of Iteria and Trachonitis and Lysanias, ruler of Abilene, during the high priesthood of Annas and Caiaphas, He'd have gotten in trouble with his congregation right there <laughs> if he had one. That's when the word of God came to John, the son of Zechariah, in the wilderness of all places. So what's the meaning of this? Well, Luke wants us to understand that ours is a God of history. The word of God doesn't hover above us timelessly. It's timely. And sometimes it comes with a clarion call. Time's up. Rome was paranoid about losing any power. It protected its empire in the way all empires do. Using language of peace, it talked about the Pax Romana, the peace of Rome. This was the aim of every emperor, but Rome's rulers preserved the peace at any cost. And Luke is telling us that all human efforts to bring lasting peace by force or violence will fail. God's coming into the world, notice, is announced by John the baptizer. He's viewed as an antisocial character, living out in the wilderness, wearing the skins of camel hair. Uh, he is, uh, he's eating locusts and wild honey. He's viewed as antisocial, but he's really radically social. That is, he's critical of the way society is ordered in opposition to the full dignity and humanity and equal standing of every human being. And he's announcing the advent of a new egalitarian community, the kind that God intended from the beginning, true shalom or salam. This is why he invites people to repent and be baptized. Repentance is not just feeling sorry for our private sins and asking God to forgive them. It's turning away from and repenting of our complicity to the crippling structures of society that give cushy privileges to some and crush others. John is calling his people and us to be immersed in the logic of a new community that is a revolutionary way of ordering human life. And to do so, he repeats the words of the prophet Isaiah. Prepare the way of the Lord. Make his paths straight. Every valley shall be filled, and every mountain and hill be made low, and the crooked shall be made straight, and the rough ways made smooth, and all flesh shall see the salvation of God. And what does that mean? Well, it's a metaphor taken from everyday life back then. And it touches on how we organize society and impacts how people relate to one another. When a king, see, would be coming from a distant place into a village or, or town, the people would go out into the hinterlands to welcome him. And the way they would welcome him is to do road work. That is, to smooth the path, to make it an easy way for them to come in, but also to make it possible for everyone to see by leveling the ground so that everyone could enjoy the coming of this dignitary. Wilshire's Colin Yarbrough has written an important book about Dallas. It's titled 
paved a way infrastructure, policy, and racism in an American city. When Colin, back there by the way, uh, was in a class at SMU, he was researching a paper on how Dallas's highways were erected and realized, oh my goodness, how the decisions favored the white wealthy parts of Dallas and divided this city from the black and poor parts of Dallas. Black neighborhoods were systematically split up, making it harder for some citizens to access the services of public life. These neighborhoods were ghettoized by design, not by the neglect of those who live there. They were neglected by intent. His book chronicles the decisions that were made and how they have come to make us the way we are. But what has been done can be undone and redone. We've heard a lot about the recent infrastructure bill that's passed Congress, barely, but nonetheless, uh, that will put amazing amounts of money into fixing decaying roads and bridges and ports that have been left untended for decades. But how that money is spent, I tell you, will say a great deal about our public repentance, about what we have learned, and about what we want our nation to be, whether we will, in fact, prepare the way of the Lord according to this vision. All this, though, reveals our spiritual condition. Do we really want all flesh to see the salvation of God? Or do we really want some to while others are left out? Fred Craddock tells a story about a young boy who was standing outside the ticket booth at a circus wanting to go in. The ticket taker said to him, son, aren't you going in? I don't have any money, the boy replied as he stood outside, listening to the joyous sounds coming from within and consoling himself. The ticket taker, in a moment of generosity, says, son, come tomorrow after school. We're having a matinee. I'll let you in free. Whew, the boy could hardly pay attention in school the next day. It seemed like school would never be over. It was a hundred years to him. When are we finally getting out of here, he thought. And finally, when the bell rang, he went down to the circuit's grounds and stood there before the ticket taker, waiting, 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 until finally the ticket taker announced in a loud voice, all right now, all you boys and girls, come on in. You can come for free. The boy looked around, and there must have been 40 or 50 other boys and girls. And he turned and walked away. The ticket taker said, son, aren't you going in? It's free. And he said, I, I don't think I want to. There's something about feeling that you're the only one that is dulled a bit when you discover that someone has said, everyone. I was talking this week to Lillian Daniel, who preached here for us two weeks ago. She's a congregationalist minister, and uh, it's a tradition that practices infant baptism. And so I was showing her around the church, and she loved it, but the thing that captured her, most, her attention most was this place up here, the baptistry, what she calls the tank. <laughs> she told me that she's preaching on this same text about John and baptism of repentance and all of that, and so she wanted to know everything. How do you do it? What's the meaning of it? Where does it all come from? And I told her among other things, about how the early church baptized people in the nude. Now, males and females separated, you understand. But they did so so that no one could say by their clothing whether any were wealthy or poor, 
high-born or low, well-connected or not. Now, we don't continue that practice today. We are already scandalous enough around here, don't you know? <laughs> but back in the day, when one was baptized and coming up out of the water, that's when they put the white robe on them, indicating forgiveness and purity and welcome into the community that was now organized in opposition to the way of the world. From then on, no matter what others thought of them, they were sisters and brothers together in Christ, siblings in spirit, all of them standing equally before God and one another. But what's more, they were expected then to do road work in the world. That is to prepare the way of the Lord, paving a way to welcome everyone freely and celebrating that everyone had access to God. That work begins with us inside the church and carries over to the way we function outside the church. This is why Wilshire's membership policy doesn't make it about some having been baptized the right way or others the wrong way, some being able to be part of our church and others not based upon a mode of baptism, because baptism symbolizes the radical welcome into the community of Christ. And it's also why we don't make race or marital status or sexual orientation or gender identity to be a qualifier or disqualifier for full participation. Every body, we like to say, all means all. All flesh shall see the salvation of God together. This is the peace of Advent that we anticipate. This is the peace of Christ, the promised peace within and the peace without. And the church is here to bear witness to it. And so I would ask you again to say it with me with feeling, church. The peace of the Lord be always with you.